Well, hello and welcome everyone to this really wonderful presentation we have in store for you here at Wright Capital Financial Planning Software. My name is Daniel Gregoire. I'm the uh, Customer Relationship Manager here at Wright Capital. And, you know, we're thrilled to really be here today with Johnny Sanquist from, you know, Three Crowns Copywriting and Marketing. Johnny, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, Daniel, thanks for having me. I'm excited yeah. to do this. Of course, yeah. So before I let Johnny go into some really great content for all of you, I have a couple housekeeping items as always, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. So first and foremost, today we're, we're here, uh, we're, we have a great presentation focused on how to use storytelling in your marketing. This is a very relevant conversation, but we wanna encourage all of you as well to ask any questions if you have them. So within the GoToWebinar control panel, you will see a questions dropdown area. That's where you can type in any questions that you have during the conversation. We'll reserve some time at the end to, to make sure we go through through those, we're expecting the content to be around 30, 35 minutes uh, ish, and then we'll be sure to dive into to some of those great questions that you have. In addition to that, I'll remind all of you that this webinar will be hosted on Right Capital's Help Center. So if you want to catch a replay of it for uh, some additional, uh, you know, resources for you, you can do that. Just as a reminder, though, the handouts and the other things that are going to be a part of the webinar today are just for those attending live. So we, we certainly appreciate you being here and we're excited to be with all of you. And, you know, of course, uh, you know, Johnny's wonderful. He's been with us a few times here at Right Capital. But for those of you who don't know, he is the founder and CEO of Three Crowns Copywriting and Marketing, which is a full service marketing partner that helps launch, grow and scale businesses. Uh, Johnny, uh, you got your start at, at Orion, and I think you've been plenty other places since. But um, you know, we're thrilled yep. to have you, and, and thanks for for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I'm excited to go get into this. This will be a lot of fun. Great. So with that, I'll switch presenter rights over to you, and you can uh, okay. start diving in. Sounds great. I will grab that and then share my screen. Okay, there we go. And you're not seeing my screen yet, but you will in just a moment. There we go. There we go. You can see everything okay? Loud and clear, yep. Perfect, well, let's get into it. Uh, we just saw this screen, so I can go ahead and, and click on through and Daniel, you gave me like a super kind introduction already, so I'm not going to spend much time here except to say that I'd love for everybody here to connect with me. I'd love to know more of you. I'm most active on LinkedIn, but you can also find me on Twitter. Kind of my primary pur purpose over there is to is to just retweet the awesome things that Sydney, our social media manager, tweets from our Three Crowns account. So there's there's that URL as well. Um, but we'll we'll get into this and and get to uh get to the stories which is i know what what everybody wants to uh wants to hear about today so now you know where to find me let's start let's talk about how stories are made so in 1999 uh filmmaker richard linklair that's him right here he got an idea he asked himself what if i made a movie about the era of our lives that we call childhood and what it means to grow up. Seems like like a big daunting question, right? Like there there have been a handful of lasting coming of age stories uh, here done recently, but like that's a big task to undertake. Um, but Linkletter is already a hugely successful director so kind of like big projects is is you know what what he's all about it's what he lives for you know he made classics like dazed and confused you know where we all got introduced to matthew mcconaughey's iconic character and now we have been saying all right all right all right ever since one of my favorite catchphrases you ever hear uh he made school of rock arguably jack black's finest work up until he started as bowser in this year's Super Mario Brothers movie. And he's also made the what's what's known now as the Before Trilogy. So three of the most celebrated romantic movies of the last several decades. Um, the trilogy began with Before Sunrise in 1995. It continued with Before Sunset in 2004. And so far it culminated in Before Midnight in 2013. 
uh, starring the same two people, same two actors in, in all three, as you can tell from this, just showing the progression through those three decades. Um, but you can tell from how these three movies span such a long time period. They're made in, like I said, three successive decades that Linklater has got no problem with projects that, that can take years to complete, as long as it means bringing his vision to life. So as he thought about how to create a truly unique film about growing up, he got a unique idea. What if he didn't do you know, what all other directors did, which was cast different actors for different time periods that the movie would cover, right? Like we watch Forrest Gump, very obviously Forrest Gump as a kid is not Forrest Gump as, a, as an adult, just Tom Hanks. Uh, but Linklater said like, what if he instead just cast the same actors and just filmed them literally growing up? So filming for this movie began in May, 2002. And like, as you could probably imagine, a lot of life, happened along the way with this idea, this approach to filming. So firstly, Linklater couldn't get all the funding for the movie all at once because, you know, contractually, this is a long multi-year multi -year contract. So because filming took so long, he only got a little of that contract released each year for the new scenes he was going to film every year. So him and the crew would get together for about a week, a year to shoot new scenes. And so he'd get about 200000 a year uh, to film this. And one year, the production company just forgot to pay him. And so he had to fund the filming for that year out of his own pocket. He got paid later, but you know, life happening. Another year, his daughter, Lorelai, who had a part in the movie, um, after a couple of years of this, she was like, dad, I don't want to do this anymore. Can you like, like I carry a drink and die or something, like just rewrite the script a little bit so that I don't have to be involved anymore. Um, and he declined to honor her request, but that had to be some awkward like dinner table conversations, right? And then still later on, you know, Linklater made one of his stars, Ethan Hawke, promise that if Linklater died during, before he could finish the film, that Hawke would step in, be the director and finish things for him. So he had contingency plans. This is a long project. This story is a long time to complete. And then obviously he had to contend with what we see on the screen here is child actors literally growing up during filming, they're living their own lives and growing up in front of the camera almost. But thankfully, Linklater survived through the end of production. He's still making movies. And in 2014, 12 years after he first began production, Boyhood released to widespread acclaim. And it was long, it was arduous, but Linklater knew this was a story he had to tell because he knew it would resonate with and it would impact people. And that's why we tell stories in the first place. And what I'd like you to think about as we embark on you know, the rest of our time together today is this. Do you have a story good enough to spend 12 years on? Like your first reaction might be something like, Johnny, what are you talking about? I'm a business owner, I'm a financial advisor. I am I'm not a director. I don't even have a story, let alone one I'm gonna work on, you know, putting together for 12 years. And that is a natural first reaction. I might expect to hear some of that. Or you might say like, okay, I'm with you. You know, I'm a business owner. I understand that my story is gonna be constantly evolving. If I'm in business for 12 years, of course I'm working on my story for 12 years. But you might also think like, my story is not interesting enough to spend an afternoon on, much less 12 years on. But I want you to, to take heart, like if this is some of your initial reactions, because your brand and even yourself don't have to be mesmerizing. Although, you know, we can do some work to get you there. But because good storytelling isn't about prioritizing yourself, we have some area to work. In an advisory business, it's only about helping clients to see a better future for themselves. So we're going to get into the the hows and the whys soon. But first I wanna ask you, you know, let's, let's approach it from this angle. What makes a story good anyway? What even is a story? One way that we've come to define and discuss what makes a story is known in literature circles as the monomyth. In modern phrasing, you may have heard this described as the hero's journey. 
It's a very popular way for marketers to insert storytelling into businesses. And it's probably most popularized by Donald Miller's story brand, who I'm sure some of you on this webinar, you've encountered it, you've read it, you've heard people talk about it. But it all comes really from this famous book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, uh, written in 1949. Joseph Campbell identified how many, many stories shared a common basic structure. And he, in one sentence, describes a narrative pattern like this. The hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered and a decisive victory is won. Now in his book, Campbell describes 17 stages to the monomyth. I'm gonna slim that down for our purposes. That's a little bit overwhelming. Not all of it's gonna be applicable for us in business, but I'll focus on just the five stages of narrative that we need to know for, steli for, for, for storytelling in business, okay? So here they are. Stage one, a hero is called to adventure. Uh, from that call, they might refuse or ignore their calling. There's always some type of resistance at the beginning of the hero's journey. But then they meet with a mentor, and often the mentor gives them something to help them in their quest, right? Like, like a lightsaber, if we're thinking about Obi-Wan and Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. Uh, and then they, they go out, they obviously meet obstacles and challenges, and oftentimes the mentor helps them overcome them. And then once they do overcome those challenges, they receive the rewards. So this is the path of the story that we're going to follow. It's not all that different from the elements of plot. Uh, you might recall this story diagram from ninth grade English class, and I am sorry if that gives you PTSD, but I once taught ninth grade English myself. I am a recovering short-term uh, high school teacher, and so I you know, absolutely could not stop myself from including this in today's presentation. It's been a long time since I've been able to use this, guys, and I was just really excited to have it here. Um, but the story pattern, again, is similar, right? We've got the exposition where we, we meet our hero. We've got that inciting moment, which is that call to action, kicks off the rising action, which leads to the climax where our hero is either going to, to triumph or fail. Then we have this falling action where we kind of tie up our, our loose ends and, and you know, finally the, the resolution. So we've got a beginning, a middle, and an end to the story. So that's the basic structure we need to tell a good story. We need a hero, we need conflict, we need resolution. But why do we care? Like, why can't we just sit down at a conference table, show a prospective client how the numbers that we can get them are bigger than the numbers the other person can get them, call it a day, and like all go on our merry way? And the simple answer is that humans are ruled by their emotions. And if emotional connection is what we need to focus on, then we need to focus on telling stories that can take hold of a person and not let them go. And when it comes down to it, a huge part of why people choose an advisor is due to that advisor's personality and how well they feel understood by them. Now, anecdotally, outside of this data, I hear this time and again, when I talk with advisors, it's like, well, we develop these relationships, clients feel connected to us, we feel connected into their lives, like relationship and trust are foundational. We understand it intuitively. And when clients take stock of what you're doing for them, a lot of it comes back just to that, to how you make them feel. Now making tactical, quantitative, fact-based arguments that might make you feel good, but it doesn't get the same attention, doesn't get the same traction as appealing to our human emotional sides. And according to Gallup research, emotions drive 70% of decisions. So it's still, you know, 30% of people out there who are a little atypical who 
make the, the decisions driven by rational, you know, logical arguments. But the vast majority of decisions we make in everyday life, and a lot of the big ones, are emotionally triggered. So for the best results, you know, we need stories supported by logic. And the research bears that out too. You know, another reason why stories matter is that stories are just easier to remember. They make things easier to remember. When you give people, you know, facts and statistics and you, you want them to understand this, you know, qu quantitative research that bolsters your argument, people re recall facts 22 times faster when they're told in a story than when they're just communicated on their own. It's a huge, huge improvement in learning and memory if we can deliver our argument in a story-based way. And lastly, you know, beyond any modern focus on, on data-driven studies, stories are just part of the fabric of human existence. They have been part of us for as long as we have existed. You know, animals carved in a cave, that is a story. Now, if at this point you're saying to yourself, okay, this is great, but like, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to create a YouTube documentary? Uh, no, like thankfully, storytelling for your business is not inspirational videos and TV advertisements. It can be, and if you wanna get into that, like awesome, fully support you, but it's much, much simpler than that. Storytelling for us is all about understanding where our clients are coming from, what's troubling them, and speaking solutions into their lives with empathy. There are three keys to building a story around your company's message with that in mind. And when I say know your ideal client, I don't mean demographically. I mean you know them in their heart and in their mind. Right? I don't know if I'm on camera anymore, but head in their heart. You need to have a, a unique value prop then that tells your brand story clearly in light of those clients that you serve. And then the cardinal rule for all storytelling is keep what you say to a minimum. So over the next few sections, I will be going through some kind of workshop style examples of these keys. So uh in that go to webinar panel you should have a, a little section where you can grab templates for yourself to use in the handout section uh you can use them in this webinar as we go or you can just grab those download them and, and come back to them after the fact now the first thing we need to do as we're building story is define our main character every great story has a memorable lead and you've got Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. You've got Elizabeth Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. You've got Ellen Ripley from Alien. You have Indiana Jones and, in, well, you know, like they're all named after Indiana Jones. But great stories have great main characters. And for the stories we need to tell, our clients are the main characters. And the way that we create a main character is to create a picture to create a description, to build a profile of the ideal client. So I'm gonna take you through five questions. There are five questions to answer, to build out these profiles and to create main character. The way that I suggest you do this is to build a description around your favorite clients that you work with right now this is the time to play favorites like i promise i will not tell anyone that who you chose first on the kickball court you know as you think on these questions the important part of this exercise is to think how can i build a main character who other people will empathize with and see themselves in because that's what makes a really great character it's someone we can identify with they are relatable so your ideal client persona serves that purpose for your business and the story that you want to tell to prospective clients. Psychographics 
what people think and feel is the most important part of fleshing out your main character. But we also should identify any demographics that matter too. So continue again with your favorite client as a guide. And if you don't have a strong sense of how to answer these questions, uh, use that favorite client to guide you. So you know, how old are they? Um, a lot of times people will pick an age range, but I say like hone in, just give them an age. You know, don't say 50 to 55 and waffle around on, just say, hey, you know, Grace is 52 years old. That's who she is. You know, where do they work? Where do they live? What values do they hold? That gets into that psychographic element. These are the types of questions that you can start to use to niche down and identify a segment of people that you can serve really, really well by being able to speak really, really specifically into their life. Question three, you know, gets to you part of a lot of the work that's done. What's their financial situation? You know, are you trying to identify with people who are high earners, but who are younger? Are you trying to work with just people in or near retirement? Like the answer to this question, it can radically change the types of services that, that you offer, types of services that they even care about, and even sometimes the way that you charge fees, you know? In, in some cases, advisors will um, you know, do like a, a flat retainer style to those Henry's as opposed to the traditional uh, AUM fee. But understanding this is also going to change how you communicate your story and what methods you use to get it out there. For question four, what you want to think about when you're answering this one is what are the common problems that people bring to you? Was there a specific event? the inciting moment, right? If we remember our plot diagram, that occurred in their life that moved them to believe that they needed to take action and seek financial advice in the first place. The way that I would approach this is I would actually use real data if, if you can. You know, take a look at the last six months of new clients that you've run on, the last 12 months, and see if you can identify some common threads on the types of problems that are bringing people your way. What moments are causing them to heed the call to adventure. Whatever those things are, you know, identifying those problems is gonna play a large role in how you address and how you speak to your ability to solve those problems. Which brings us to question number five. After you've identified those problems that people bring to you, you go to the next step and you take a look at how you've added value into their lives, how you've helped them move past, you know, that place of being uncomfortable to being confident to take stock of your solutions to the problem. So if we wanna make things super simple with marketing communications, what it is all about is delivering the right message to someone at the right time that they need to hear it. Very simple statement, not as easy to put into practice, but, but our guiding uh, tenants should be simple statements like that to keep us focused. And that starts by understanding what are their problems and how do I solve them? And then, then you can communicate that message out to people. And when someone hears that message at the right time, you know, they can see that you are someone who can help them solve the problems they're experiencing, but you can be that mentor. Now, all good stories need something to be at risk. And not necessarily high stakes, but, but personal stakes. You need to understand if a client does not get sound financial advice, what happens to them? And importantly, what do they believe will happen to them? Like, do they think they'll be okay? But maybe their life just won't be as good as it could have been. Or are they at a point where they they believe that the stakes is that, you know, they're out of hope to manage things on their own. And without the right guide, they're worried that things are just going to crumble. So identify what will happen if they refuse that call to adventure and they never answer it. You know, this might be, this might not be something that you write specifically into your messaging, into your communications, but the shadow of it should always be there because we have to understand what are we, what are we even fighting for? We have to be able to communicate to clients. You know, we understand what it is you're fighting for. So we've got our main character. How do we fit into their story? 
you lay the groundwork for a compelling brand story by knowing your unique value proposition. You've probably heard this a ton of times that UVP, if you're a fan of Samantha Russell from FMG, I know you've heard her talk about it. And it should be built out of the persona work that we just did, where you identify how you help your ideal clients. Your unique value prop is essentially your brand story in one sentence. Traditional stories of yesteryear are boring. They say, I create financial plans and you can work with me if you have 500,000 to invest and transfer all your accounts to my firm. That does nothing to get people emotionally invested in that decision. A modern brand story focus is typically more emotional driven. It appeals you know, to a higher sense of self. So let's look, at, let's, let's look at how to craft that. The best formula for a compelling brand story is to focus it on your clients and not even on yourself. In this model, remember, we're, we're thinking back to our narrative, our story. In this model, you're the guide and the mentor. You are not the hero call to adventure. That is your client. We are figuring out how we step in to their story. This is as a handout, so I'm gonna move on in case you haven't you know, taken down what that formula is. But here's how this formula can look in practice. Just one brief example of how you can build, that is, build this out. Parents with young children work with me so they can know for certain they can pay for future educational expenses while still investing enough to take some memorable vacations and enjoy a comfortable and rewarding retirement when time is right. So here's what this does. It's specific. Parents with young children, that it gives us a very specific persona that we can draw the rest of the story around. It addresses emotional triggers, um, you know, things that are gonna be incredibly important to this type of client. Their children's well-being, you know, making memories with their kids, and you know, obviously not running out of money. That's an important part. And importantly, it is entirely focused on the client's wants and needs and fears. Uh, I, like I know someone's compliance officer right now, like pick their head up from their desk and they're feeling like a disturbance in the uh, in the world because I use the words for certain, but I kept it in there for effect. So right now, you know, we'll just pretend this is an internal working document. Yeah, we won't, won't worry about those, uh, those getting right up to the edge with what compliance officers like. But the last key to good storytelling is keep it short. You know, uh, no one really needs a 50 page brand book. Like I get it, they're fun to make. I love diving in the brand and doing all this stuff. They are fun to look at, but everything that we've just gone through gives you everything you need. We all remember how Game of Thrones ended. It went on too long. George R. R. Martin couldn't figure out how to, still hasn't finished the story. And so the showrunners just didn't do the best job. We'll leave it at that. It's been a couple of years, but I still won't spoil it for you. But keep your story short. Worryness is your enemy. Okay, so let's come back to where we started. Let's build a simple story structure from what we've done. We're going to take elements from the exercises that we just did and plug them back into the five-part narrative that we looked at earlier. So. We've got the call to adventure. The client sees a need. Oh, man, I, I want to retire soon, right? But the call is refused. You know, they start to shop around. Maybe they take that first step, but there are so many confusing options. So they let it fall by the wayside until they come across your firm. Now, you have content and messaging on your website that speaks directly to the challenges they're facing, but that they couldn't find an answer to before now. And now, finally, they see the path through the obstacles in their way because you have entered their story as that mentor. And you help them see exactly and precisely how you can step into their life to get them to that goal at the end, whatever that goal is. If it's traveling to see their grandkids more often, if it's buying a boat, whatever they want to do, right? You're able to get them there because you've been specific and intentional about creating this story. And now you can communicate that back out to these same types of people. There are a lot of places where you can advertise and you can push out your message, but what are the best channels for incorporating story-based content? I'm gonna give you five examples here. 
first up, we've got Instagram. In each example, I'm also going to give you uh, an example of uh, something that I think is a, a great example and a great storyteller uh, themselves. So Tremaine Willis is my example here on Instagram. But Instagram is visually compelling. You know, imagery and video take center stage. And we know from a study done at UC Davis that in emotionally charged images change behavior more than just words. So the more we can lean into images, into video, we're going to be better st storytellers. I know that we think of storytelling you know, in these very text-based ways because of novels and literature, but especially when we're approaching things from a professional services business standpoint, like financial advisory firms, like being able to get that face-to-face -face time with folks is so important for establishing likability, trust, credibility, and being able to uh, just really infuse a personality and a story in everything that's being done. The next one, you're probably tired of hearing this, but it's YouTube. Yeah, I'm on that train. Like I think all advisors should, should in a perfect world, have a YouTube channel. Mariner Wealth is a really nice job at their production and just variety of content. I was actually like pretty surprised to see this, uh, this good um, variety of content from a larger firm. Um, a lot of times it's the smaller RAs who are really leading the way um, on YouTube with video content. Um, but YouTube's got a huge reach, 122 million daily visitors. It's a great place to be found. And video creates more powerful memories, okay? So this ties into Instagram too. Viewers remember 95% of a message when you deliver it by video, but only 10% by text. It just sticks in our memory better because we like looking at people as people. And we've got TikTok. Um, Brittany Castro is one of the best you know, finance creators around. I There are a couple accounts. I think Brittany Castro 33 is actually the, the real Brittany Castro. So fact check me if you know it's not, but I think I found the right one. Um, but TikTok again, video centric content. Here's the thing, if you are into millennial and Gen X um, target, TikTok has 165 million users in that 35 to 44 age group. It's a lot of people. It's not just 17 to 20 year olds, even though that's the biggest base. And there's only 5 million businesses that actively post, right? So, and not all advisors, that's for sure. You know, a lot of not great personal finance pros, but that's not a ton of business content. So there's some fields to explore. And I wasn't able to find this broken down by age segment, but the average user spends 95 minutes a day in the app. So people who use it are highly engaged with using it. And then number four, podcasts. Podcasts are designed for long form conversation and storytelling. Like this is where it shines, right? And podcasts and YouTube can play off together as the same content, but in just different, live in different places. You've probably seen these things. 60% of Americans listen to podcasts. 45% of listeners have household incomes of 250K and up. So the demographics tell us that, hey, this can be a worthwhile place to spend your time. And you know, just this morning, I was having a chat with my friend, Matt Halloran over at Proudmouth. Proud, they're a great podcast company. And we were talking about how there's this... Um, misunderstanding that all advisors are doing podcasts. It's really only like 10 to 12% that have one out there. So there are green fields if you think that this is a channel for you to explore. And then the last, the last channel I'm going to talk about, the last thing, customer testimonials. Nothing sells better than customer approval. You know, the SEC marketing rule update, the new SEC marketing rule, eventually we are going to have to find a better way to talk about that than calling it the new SEC marketing rule, you know, when it's been around for five to 10 years, but for now we'll stick with that name. Uh, but nothing, nothing sways people more than real people. 92% of people read testimonials when they make a purchase decision. 88% trust reviews as much as personal recommendations. You know, these are broad industry surveys. They're not specific to finance, but when we pull those over and look in the finance specific, it's, it's not hugely different. Um, you know, we are such a referral based industry overall. It catches my eye when, you know, nearly nine out of 10 people say, yeah, I, I trust reviews as much as personal rec. I mean, that is 
that is uh, getting referrals without actually relying on your clients to talk one-on-one -on -one and have personal conversations you can accomplish that now i know like a lot of you are of course hesitant to dive into testimonials and the new ways that we can use these things and there are obviously compliance things to keep in mind right you, you have to be equitable like if you're going to ask for reviews you have to ask every single one of your clients in the same way so it's got to be a process that you put in place whether you put in annual meetings or send up an email to everyone you, you can't just cherry pick your favorite clients you can't do that you do have to include the proper disclosures um i'm just going to give a shout out to a new firm i just met them last week at wealth management edge conference but wealth tender who this screenshot is from uh they're a new firm and they're one of these new companies that are starting up to make it simple and compliant to get more testimonials. Um, so kind of recording what the relationship is, putting those disclosures on automatically, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and I think that there's so much opportunity to take advantage of testimonials and weave story in through your uh, the actual words of actual clients telling their stories instead of trying to take those stories and, and retell them. We're almost getting to the end here in the end. I know what I want to do here is just give a few brief takeaways on how to implement all of this. But we want to be as actionable as we can. So let's just go through the checklist. Build your personas for real clients. Build your brand around those clients, not around yourself. Then create a story or a narrative for each one of those client personas that goes all the way from inciting moment to the resolution of that story. And then build those narratives into your website copy, into the content you create, into the testimonials that you feature. So use these narratives as guideposts for all your communication. And you can even build that narrative into something as, as, as routine as you know, an investment proposal meeting, right? You can build your pitch in a story format. You use that time to tell the client their story back to them through empathetic, active listening, right? That's what really what this, this comes back to. Um, so, you know, you could have a, a meeting where you just say, hey, here's the old portfolio, here's the new portfolio, here's how they compare with the allocations and, you know, why over this one, I recommend this one. And you want to get into those level of detail, but you also want to say, hey, Gary and Susan, you know, you said you reached out to me because you were worried about that you didn't know what to do with Gary's 401k after retirement, right? So you're, you're repeating that first part of the story. This was your inciting moment. You're telling their story to them. And you know, you were especially worried that maybe in, in, you had two risky investments, inflation's going crazy, you know, you didn't know what would happen to that money. And you were hoping to use it to see the grandkids more often. So we're just narrating them through their story that we that we know. All right. We're we're talking about the obstacles, the challenges that that they're trying to overcome. We're speaking into their wants and their fears. And you know, you could say, yeah, I think if we allocate to this portfolio instead, then you're probably gonna be on track to see them as often as you want. So you're coming in, you're bringing that story to its conclusion, right? You're bringing it through to resolution. Like, okay, we can navigate these obstacles, we can come through here. And all the while you're just positioning yourself you're acting as that guide in the story you're never coming out and taking the spotlight you're taking center stage you know, you're talking through that brand story where here's what i know you've told me you want about your life about your own story and here's how we're going to work together to come to that resolution point so before i wrap things up i'm just going to leave you with this i talked about instagram tiktok youtube but you have to know who you are you have to know who your clients are and you have to you have to know what you actually like to do. Like let's just be honest. If there's a snowball's chance in hell of you ever getting in front of a camera, then YouTube and TikTok probably should not be part of your marketing strategy. Or you should find a different spokesperson for your company if you really want to get into them. Okay. But you need to be in the center of these street circles. You need to know where your ideal clients spend their time. You need to know what type of content you do best, right? If you're a talker, then podcasting could be great for you. Uh if you you know, were a lit major in college you want to get back to the writing roots maybe you should just focus on blog but know what type of content you do best and know what type of platform know which platform you like most if you are not a fan of elon musk then don't worry about twitter like 
it's great for your brand to be in all these places, but I know that you will stick to the strategy that you actually like. So find that and do that. Okay, and that's what I'm gonna leave you with. Be there in the center so that you can be consistent with, with your marketing. And now I know we got some time for Q&A. Um, so Daniel, I'm gonna let you come back in and we can we can grab some questions. Yes, Johnny, well, thank you so much. That was amazing. I will say you had me on the hook all the way from you know Matthew McConaughey all the way through Jon Snow. So I really appreciate all the great storytelling you uh, bestowed upon us today, and and certainly I think it was you know really valuable stuff. I mean the reality is you know to your point, knowing you know your ideal client and painting that picture and working through that process to really get a good under, under understanding of the value that that you are bringing to the table. But it, you know telling that story in a modern uh, way is just so important. But it's really all dials back to that, you know, that empathetic and active listening, right? And being there Absolutely. and being personal and being, you know, you being present with, with with your with your audience. So I can say as well, I had, you know, lots, you know, lots of good, you know, questions coming in. You answered a fair amount of them on the way, but I think one that that, you know, stuck out to me. That's always good. Yeah, was was that, you know, when we're talking about storytelling, yeah. You know, yeah. in a long form on a podcast and YouTube, it's it's easier to really communicate that and bring that out and, and flesh okay. that out. But you know, how would you say you know advisors can you know adapt that to potentially short form content? Um, but with like, yeah. a, you know, to your point, you know, Twitter, you know, if someone's going to go there, you know, do you have any recommendations on how to adapt that messaging as it relates to that? So I think best way to get into a short form content format and be able to kind of place the uh the narrative structure of story first and foremost is just to approach your content from problem solution format right there's advisors who do a great job of this even just on their website where it's like here's the problem you're facing here's the solution i give you and that plays well out in social media it plays well into uh, images that you can create gives you a chance to be really uh tight with like a short video that you can create. So I think if you can hone in and focus around content creation of just problem solution format and write your copy on that, record your content in that format, you can hit on uh, those kind of emotional triggers in, in a real quick and factual way. Wonderful. And, you know, along those lines, when we're talking about these channels, you know, I loved your last slide when we were talking about, you know, what's right for you and, and ultimately, you know, where where do you align, but also where are your clients aligning? But from uh, maybe just yeah. from a, a, an abstract thought process, you know, mm -hmm. from your perspective, what would be, you know, maybe the most approachable channel that you would see, you know, uh, again, I know it's it depends. Oh, yeah. but, um, from the most approachable. approachable. I love that. That's a great. That's a great way to phrase it. I don't think anybody's ever asked me the most approachable channel. Um, I'm gonna say I think that I'm gonna answer this backwards. Uh, <laughs> video is probably like the least approachable as far as like getting started with comfortable comfortable ability, right? I don't know if that's a word even, but uh, but it's also uh, I think the most impactful. But as far as like the the lowest barrier to entry. For advisors to get into um i still think um linkedin and facebook are, are going to be those two um i think if you're focused more on the um individuals who are still working uh linkedin has done a lot of good things to improve their platform and make it more than you know five years ago it was kind of like a joke of like who checks linkedin you're just getting random spam messages but there's about it's a valuable content place for content creators now and the Facebook's kind of a little standby, right? And it's it's become a very important social hub for especially um, older Americans, like 50 and up, 60 and up. Um, I think if you're tapping into either one of these, into any of these, it's super important to know and to understand just the numbers of where people are gonna be spending their time. Because if you're pushing messages out where your your clients aren't spending their time, you're wasting your time, right? And also you need to understand your own personal reach. Uh, an advisor who's got 300 connections on LinkedIn is gonna have a very different experience starting up with content from an advisor who's got 3,000 connections, right? So understand your own organic reach. Um, and one of the best ways to expand on that right away is to start tapping into, into groups and communities on any of these social networks. And those two probably do the 
the best job of just giving you groups to be able to find and join up with and just start interacting from an altruistic conversational level to start growing that that organic reach instead of just relying on you know if you've got a couple hundred people who are going to see your posts because not all of them are going to see it so um, that's lowest barrier to entry for me great well no thank you so much that, that's really powerful and i think you know the just the thought process about you know you know telling telling the story you know both from a marketing perspective to and bringing that all the way through consistently through to you know the the from everything from your your website to the actual presentations through delivering mm-hmm. the information through a a tool whether it's right capital or others you know it's it's all you know yeah, keeping yeah. that consistency really is, it makes it so powerful so um well you know, certainly we appreciate you being here with us, Johnny. We uh, will be excitedly uh, putting this on our help center uh, as well. But I think there's just a, one more question we'll maybe get into here before we'll, we'll uh, yeah. split out. So uh, this one comes in and it says, do you recommend, you know, from your perspective, having multiple layers of marketing platforms versus just maybe one you focus on or, you know, any thoughts behind that? Oh, man, it's, it's, uh, such a good question. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to... I would say that it's going to ultimately depend on what the structure your company is like. Okay, it's a different answer for a solo advisor versus an advisor firm that's got like 10 people. Okay, if you're a solo advisor and you're just getting started with this, you want to hone in and be very dedicated to um, and, uh, and focused on like one channel and then start to build from there. Like once you're super comfortable and you've got your process honed in, then build on top of that, right? Um, if you're a larger firm, you can probably start up with more of a multi-channel approach uh, right away because you may have more time to share and split or may have the resources to like bring in some outsourced help, freelancers or an agency, things like that, right? Um, but uh, almost always I'd say, um, focus in on what you know you're gonna be good at right away, stay there. Once your process is locked down tight, then start to add to it. Um, because you do, as you mature in that process, want to add to it because you want to be able to, to, to add uh, to that reach and to be able to have people see you across multiple places. Um, and so it's just going to, it's going to better you in the long run. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Thank all of you for attending today, this wonderful presentation. We thoroughly enjoyed it. I can say uh, that from experience, Johnny. So we appreciate you being here. We look forward to seeing everyone on the next Right Capital Practice Management webinar. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.